For more than half of my life, I've known exactly what it feels like to curl my fingers around a handful of teeth. The rough edges and smooth bumps, wet and sticky with blood, wane like an anchor in my memory, pulling me back in time to a small town in Mexico and the day I lost my faith but got to keep my life. I grew up in the Lutheran church, but like the SoCal beach version of a Lutheran, less Bible thumping, more Bible reading, like in small groups where we debate tricky passages and question meaning. Less judgment and more, hey, welcome sinners, saints, and surfers. <laughs> less, oh, I'll pray for you, and more, what can I do for you? Do you need a chicken from Costco? You know what, here's a chicken from Costco. Youth group is a big part of church life when you're a young Christian, and ours had recently been taken over by the new junior pastor, Pastor Jim. He tried so hard to be hip, but he was a <laughs> bit over-eager for teenagers to take seriously. Us kids in this group, we'd grown up together. We even attended nursery school in this very church, and the new pastor was, well, new. But he was a good man, and he loved us kids, so we rolled with it. We worked service projects together and sometimes just hung out in the youth space, enjoying the familiar company. By high school, though, we were starting to identify more with our school friends and less with our church friends. Youth groups started to feel more like obligation than community. But one thing it had going for it was the trips. We traveled to Dallas for a uh, youth gathering where Maya Angelou spoke to a stadium full of kids and captured us all with her powerful voice and words. We worked a service project in Oakland, cleaning up a neighborhood park so the kids could play there again. We went on retreats and talked and said difficult words to each other. We worked hard, and the work, it always felt good. When a trip to a Mexican orphanage was planned, I eagerly signed up. I talked Don, a school friend, and he's signing up with me, and the two of us climbed into a car in the church parking lot one Saturday, ready to make the drive over the border and change some lives. Pastor Jim, he drove his car, and his brother Steve drove a small 80s-era four-door hatchback. He usually made this trip in a large pickup truck, filled to the brim with food, clothing, whatever supplies he could get his hands on, and lash on board. But his car, it had more seatbelts, he told us, so he could take more kids. Only Don and I ended up in his car, while the other three kids went with Pastor Jim. I called shotgun, and off we went, caravan style, to another country. Steve was having a blast driving this small car, such a contrast to the plotting supply truck he usually drove. This little thing could corner and zipped along the roads eagerly, making up for its lack of power with its small car rattle and maneuvering. After a couple hours on the road, Dawn had turned to one of her favorite subjects, roller coasters. She loved them, was obsessed in fact, and she and Steve were passionately discussing their favorite rides and amusement parks when we approached a small town where we were to make a pit stop. An old brick mission sat well off the road, and the plan was to exchange some supplies with the nuns here before continuing down Baja to the orphanage. You really like roller coasters, huh? Steve asked Don. Yep. Then you'll love this. Steve grinned and gathered some speed, accelerating along the main road. He yanked the wheel to the right, dropping off the pavement and onto the dirt road aimed at the mission. The sun was low, sitting like a wild ball of flames bursting from the mission rooftop, so bright that when the car swung around to frame it in its windshield, it was startling, like a light bulb suddenly bursting, glowing hot and bright for a second too long. At first, with the confusion of the sun in my face, the deafening sound of the crash almost seemed appropriate. But then my whole body flung forward, the shoulder belt snapping against my chest as it tensed. It felt like I hung there for a second, the world quiet and calm, my body straining forward inches from the glass. And then the roar of blood in my ears, my body crashed back into the seat, all the air forced painfully from my lungs. Everything became still. I tried to breathe, to drag some air into my lungs, but my muscles were in a riot and I found myself gasping for breath, desperate and frightened. I couldn't move anything and so carefully shifted my eyes to the left and saw Steve, eyes wide in shock and pain, then shifted my gaze to my right to see my pastor studying my face from the car next to me. His eyes flickered from me to his brother and to Don in the back seat shooting wide open and alarmed, fumbling to release his own seatbelt and tumble from his car. My muscles finally released and I gasped loudly, sucking in a huge, racking, labored breath, one that had me instantly in tears. My chest was tight, 
already bruising from the belt, fear, pain, confusion, and a flood of, flood of sobbing that would take hours to stem. My pastor was yanking at the back door, yelling something I couldn't understand. He smacked his palm against the unyielding metal in frustration and moved to my door, which he was finally able to open. Snapping his fingers in my face, trying to get my focus, I was finally able to grasp onto his words. I need you to move now. I wasn't sure I could move at first, but when he barked another now at me, I jumped up and exited the car, surprised to find that all my parts worked and that I could breathe again, but terrified about what was unfolding. In the 80s, car safety standards did not require shoulder belts in the back seats, only the front. Steve was used to this drive in a large truck, one that was raised up from the ground higher than the hatchback. He had never noticed the tip of the boulder protruding from the ground here, as the truck always cleared it. The engine block of the hatchback had hit it square, bringing the car to an abrupt stop and throwing Dawn's body face forward into my seat, then tossing her back with enough force to break the back of the seat she'd been sitting against. Her face was a mess of blood, and she was utterly silent, eyes open, wide, staring upward. The impact had jammed her door, which is why my pastor was now climbing over the front seat to get to her, taking her hands in one of his and speaking softly, gently, exploring the damage done to her in the crash. Steve was moving now as well, albeit painfully and slowly, what would later be revealed as a torn muscle in his back, making each movement screamingly brutal. There were nuns running towards us, old crones with deeply wrinkled and alarmed faces, their habits flapping behind them. Let's get her inside, Steve said to his brother. There's a payphone in town. I'll walk in. I'll see about some help. The nuns took us inside the rock walls of the mission. They leaned us into a small room with a cot. I was handed a bottle of water and draped with a blanket while a softly crooning nun laid Dawn in the narrow bed, speaking to her in hushed Spanish. Pobrecita. She dabbed experimentally at Dawn's face with a damp rag, which broke her from her silence. What happened? Where are we? Why are you crying? She was looking directly at me, ignoring the nun, her voice calm and steady, detached. The nun handed me the rag and left the room. I scooched closer to Dawn and studied her face, trying to regain my calm, but failing. We had a car accident. We're in Mexico. I'm scared. Oh. Her eyes circled the room, taking in the odd surroundings. What happened? Where are we? Why are you crying? Didn't I just answer the same set of questions? But this time, her voice sounded slightly different, somehow more muddy. I choked out a loud sob, more terrified now than ever. We had a car accident. We're in Mexico. It's, it's going to be okay. Oh, okay. Again, she looked around her. Then her words, working around what sounded like a mouthful of gravel, asked for a third time, what happened? Where are we? Why are you crying? I buried my face in my hands for a moment, then decided to try cleaning up her wounds. There was a large gash on the line of her chin, and I wasn't sure, but I thought I could see bone. I reeled, catching my breath and dipping the rag back into the bowl of now pink water, tenderly dabbing her damaged face. face. There's something in my mouth. Her words were so garbled now. I braced myself and held out my hand. Can you give it to me? She spat out a collection of something hard and wet. I balled my hand into a fist, snapping closed around the incomprehensible sight. I knew instantly what I was holding, a handful of broken teeth. Her words had been figuratively crumbling because her molars were literally crumbling in her mouth, shattered by the impact of the crash. It was all I could do to keep it together then, sobbing and scared and wanting my mom. At 15, this was too much for me to handle calmly, though I did my best as Dawn kept ejecting shards of her teeth and I just kept taking them, finally shoving them into my pocket. She was on repeat, asking the same three questions. What happened? Where are we? Why are you crying? And I kept giving the same three answers. We had a car accident. We're in Mexico. It's going to be okay. Eventually, the nun came back, followed by my pastor, we need to head north. We can't get care here, he told me. What? But doesn't she need help now? I think going north is best. This is a small town and the doctor isn't available. We need to get back into the States for help. What happened? Where are we? Why are you crying? He studied her for a moment. She's in shock. Let's move. And so he put me back in the car with the other three kids, packing us in like sardines and covering Dawn with blankets in the front seat. I cried all the way back, angry at the hours-long wait to cross into the States, the endless line of cars, wishing for an express lane for bleeding teenagers. 
Don was coming out of shock in that line, the pain and confusion slamming down on her while Mexican children banged on the windows trying to sell us gum, crosses, toys, whatever they had. Some would focus on Don's face and slink back, but most kept trying. Their need to survive as strong as hers. Even the customs agent made us wait, insisting they needed to inspect the car. I had never wanted to assault an officer so badly in my life. <laughs> Thankfully, they swept the car quickly and sent us back to the U.S., where we raced to a hospital to meet our moms, finally reaching help close to midnight. Don's mom was overwhelmed and had a hard time responding when the ER docs tried to ask questions or get her to consent to a quick form of treatment. When my mom realized what was happening, she took over, demanding the hospital bring in a plastic surgeon to sew up Don's face. Look, this happened hours ago, so you're dealing with a difficult repair, my mom tenderly told the overtired trauma doctor. She's a young woman who just might care about how her face looks. She took a deep breath and all the gentle dropped out of her face. I don't care who you have to wake up, call in, or harass. You're getting her a plastic surgeon, and you're going to make sure she has the best chance for a clean scar. My mom's a fucking superhero in a crisis. <laughs> the damage to Dawn was intense. In addition to the bone-deep cut, her jaw was broken, the majority of her molars as well. I pulled the shards from my pocket and tried to hand them to the ER doctor. Everyone was appropriately horrified. <laughs> Her recovery was long and hard, and her family poor, so they had to sue the church to cover the cost of the treatment. My youth group felt lost to me. Guilt and a $40,000 settlement forced me out the door to another youth group, one that sang songs and played games and didn't ask me to leave the country or do anything meaningful. It turns out the orphanage we were meant to visit that day had an accident of their own. A wall collapsed and someone was killed. We were destined for some tragedy that day, and ours was apparently the survivable one. To this day, I still dream about broken teeth, Don's or my own. I hold them in my hand, sometimes clean and obvious, the roots of a molar digging into my palm, or sometimes in a pulpy mass of blood, digging them free of my own mouth, spitting over and over again. Often in the middle of a seemingly normal dream, I'll reach into a pocket and feel rough edges, knowing what's in there as I draw the contents out of the dark, Unfra un afraid to uncurl my fingers. I wake with my hands in fists, afraid to open them. That was Elaine Gingery.